Thanks for tuning in to another episode of the Forgotten Hockey Players of Broadway, a nostalgic look back at our favorite Rangers from the 60s, 70s, and 80s. I'm Tom Browning, along with my co-host, Rob Berger. We can be heard on Google Play, iHeartRadio, YouTube, iTunes, SoundCloud, Spotify, and of course, our website at GoTommyBoyProductions.Lipson.com. That's GoTommyBoyProductions.Lipson, L-I-B-S-Y-N.com. Please check it out. You can capture all of our episodes on our webpage. You can contact us by just clicking on the contact bar. You can access all of our episodes. You can leave a message. We'd love to hear from you. Love to hear about the players that you would like for us to profile. Love to hear about maybe some of the seasons other than the 60s, 70s, and 80s that really made an impact on you as a fan. Again, we will be going off the menu every once in a while. We'll be talking about the current day New York Rangers, the state of the franchise. And again, we love to talk about previous playoff games, impactful trades that took place in New York Rangers history. So wherever you listen to us, please hit subscribe. It's free. So without further ado, here are your hosts, Tom Browning and Rob Berger. Thanks for tuning in to another edition of the Forgotten Hockey Players of Broadway. I'm Tom Browning, along with my partner and co-host, Rob Berger. Rob, how are you doing today, bud? I'm all right. Just living in the Las Vegas Golden Knights world. How about you? Uh, That makes two of us. I think they are such an exciting team right now. I cannot wait until the Stanley Cup Finals start uh, this coming Monday. And I guess they will be the road team. I guess regardless of who wins the series, I think Vegas is the visiting team to start. Is that right? Or Yeah, they're, they're visiting. I was, I, I would be really excited if they could start at home. I think the, the first game of the Stanley Cup Finals in Vegas would be unbelievable. I, I mean, the way they put on a show – Prior to the playoff games, I, I just think it would be one for the ages if they could open up at home. But regardless, I think it's going to be just an outstanding series. They, they are just a team that just has captured, you know, I think the s- sports fans in general are starting to really uh, take notice of this club right now. You know, you know, and there's a lot of, you know, for another day, talk about whether this is good for the sport or bad for the sport. Mm-hmm. Having an expansion team do so well so quickly, but I, I think it's spectacular. Yeah, and as I've been saying, I think... This will go down as the greatest sports achievement in my lifetime if they were to win the Stanley Cup, without a doubt. I can't see anything that uh, comes close. But but today we want to talk about a very uh, interesting subject, and, that is, and it's Rob's idea. And Rob, you can shed some light as to how you went about uh, selecting this, um, this topic. But we're going to talk about the 1978-1979 Stanley Cup playoffs, the New York Rangers Stanley Cup playoff run. A very interesting team, a team that I have vivid memories of. Uh, about team that went to the Stanley Cup Finals for the first time in seven years. Prior to that was a 1972 club that went to the Stanley Cup Finals against the Boston Bruins, but it was a team that was not expected to really compete, uh, especially a club that just had really a very average regular season. But before we get into too much detail, Rob, was your idea, give me a thought process as to how you went about selecting uh, this topic for the podcast. Well, you know, the theme of our podcast is Forgotten Hockey Players of Broadway, and I think this team encapsulates that message, that that theme of a team that we really don't talk about, and a team that's so much different from the 94 Rangers. We look back at the 94 Rangers, they were successful at President's Cup the year before, really had a great, just Hall of Fame roster. And the 79 Rangers were a team that really, that season was two teams, the Canadians and Islanders. And for the Rangers to to move into the cup final and beat the Islanders of all teams just makes it even more interesting. Yeah, it's true. I, I think the Boston Bruins were uh, just had an outstanding season, too. I remember the big three being the Canadians, Islanders, and Bruins just dominating uh, the National Hockey League. I think all three clubs had 100 points. I think the Bruins had 100 points. Islanders, I believe, had the most points in the National Hockey League that, that season. I think they won... The pre- I don't know if the President's Trophy was around at that time, but they did, I believe, lead the league in points with Montreal coming in second, if memory serves me correctly. They, they, did, they did lead the, lead the league in points. They also had Trache, who won the Art mm-hmm. Ross and the Hart Trophy, and Poppin won the Norris. Yeah. That's a dominant a team. team. And in a, in a different league, you, you, know, you talk about those three teams. I mean, to give you an idea how, how weak hockey was then, you, the Canucks made the playoffs with only 63 points. Yeah. 
Yeah. They had 25 wins and 42 losses. That'd be unheard of today. Yeah, and I think the Norris Trophy winners were the Chicago Blackhawks, I think, and they – they may have been a 500 club or not much better than that, right? I think they were. Th- they brought 500. Yeah. They were, they won, they won the, they actually, they were in the Smythe division. They won the Smythe 29 wins and 36 losses. That's right. Montreal was the Norris, right? Was Montreal the Norris? Yeah. Montreal was the Norris. A much different non geographic NHL back in 1970. Yeah. As a matter of fact, I remember the LA Kings being in the same division. In Montreal, Detroit, and Washington. Yeah. Well, I guess back then the Kings were the only West Coast team, right? I mean, they were. I don't think there was any other club in the West Coast at that time because the Seals had already gone belly up, I believe. Correct or not? Well, well the the closest would have been uh, Vancouver. Vancouver, that's right. That's right. And then yep. not West Coast, Colorado, kind of, I guess. Was Colorado in the league? Colorado, they, they were not the Devils okay. yet. So, yes, that was a lot. Gotcha. Yeah, it's been a long time ago. My gosh, it's a real long time ago. That was interesting. Yeah, it was a mishmash, right? It wasn't geographically driven. It was uh, just, I mean, my God, what the <laughs> L.A., I mean, can you imagine the travel schedule the Kings had that particular year? I mean, my goodness, <laughs> Them, they and the Canucks. But, yeah, the 1979 Rangers were a very interesting team. It was Fred Shiro's first year behind the bench after a stellar career as a coach for the Philadelphia Flyers. And, you know, Shiro came home. He grew, he grew up in the New York Rangers organization, and it's well chronicled that uh, the Rangers had to make a decision between he and Emil Francis to uh, to coach that team back in the, I guess it would have been the late 60s, mid to late 60s, and they uh, they went for Emil Francis, and Shiro wound up uh, coaching the Flyers and, you know, winning a couple of cups. And the Rangers had, you know, they were floundering. Uh, I believe Jean-Guy Talbot had been the coach before Shiro had taken over and John Ferguson had been the GM. And and I believe they gave Shiro the GM duties as well as the head coaching duties when he was the coach. But he instantly brought some um, credibility to the New York Rangers. And it was a team that had a very interesting mix of some veterans from the 1972 Stanley Cup final and, and Walt Kachuk. And you had uh, guys like Ronnie Greshner and Dave Maloney who were playing very well for the New York Rangers, had a pretty decent career. And you had some upstart. You had Phil Esposito that came over in the trade and Carol Vadney. I thought 79 was the best year Carol Vadney had with the New York Rangers, the 78-79 season. He was outstanding in the playoffs. Esposito, I think that was his best year, as we talked about before in a previous podcast. He had the two kids on his wing with Don Maloney and Don Murdoch, who I thought Don Murdoch could have gone down or should have gone down as one of the most talented wingers in Rangers history. He had that type of, of gold jacket talent, Hall of Fame talent, and he had a, a stellar playoff in 1978-79. They had some seasoned veterans like Pierre Plant, Dave Maloney, had Mike McEwen, who was a very uh, very strong offensive player, offensive defenseman. Mario Mar- Marwa, who was a tough, hard-nosed, skilled defenseman. You know, they had a real good club that year. And Bobby Sheehan came up in the playoffs against the Philadelphia. I think he played against Philadelphia. He didn't play against Van- against the LA Kings in the playoffs, but he came up from New Haven and just made an incredible impact on the on the playoffs in 1979 and. I think the Rangers wound up fourth. I think they wound up behind the Flyers and Islanders. I think they were, uh, what, a couple of games over 500, um, Rob, in that particular season? Yeah, the, the Rangers were over 500. You know, they had, they had definitely had a, a good year. Uh, it just it wasn't compared to what we saw with, with the other teams in the league. You know, you know, the, the Rangers were 40 and 29 and 11. Uh, which kept them third in the tough Patrick with the Flyers and Islanders. Yeah, I think they had a strong second half of the year. I think their first half, they were just trying to get to know Shiro, and I think they were trying to find their way. You know, and as you, as you bring up, t- you know, players on that team, we can't we really can't forget uh, the second-line center, Ulf Nilsson, yeah. who had a spectacular playoff, especially against the Islanders. Well, no, I understand. I don't think Nilsson played. Did Nilsson play? I don't think he, did he played against the Islanders. I thought, he, you know, I thought he showed up on the finals against Montreal. Uh, I know Hedberg. Hedberg played on the line with Steve Vickers, Walkachuk. He had Walkachuk, Vickers, and Hedberg. He had Esposito, Maloney, and Murdoch. I didn't think Nielsen played against. I think Nielsen played after the Islander series. He came back. That's right. He got hurt. He got hurt right right before the Islanders. Before the Islanders yeah. series, you're correct. Before the Canadians, yeah, he got hurt. He had that was what show. really uh, started the Dennis Poffin chance. He got hurt in February. The Rangers were. Rangers were really playing very well. They were playing, they were red hot, as a matter of fact. They had found their legs on the Shiro. And it was that the devastating hit that Poffin put on Ulf Nielsen that really most people feel that the Rangers would have had 
a real fighting chance against Montreal if they had had a um, uh, healthy Ulf Nielsen. And, you know, they probably rushed him back against the Canadians. He w- really didn't make a big impact uh, in that series, although he did come back. But, uh, yeah, that was um, the Islander and the Ranger fans booed Potvin every time he touched a puck during that 1979 <laughs> playoffs. Despite the fact that Poffin had a pretty decent playoffs against the Rangers and, of course, against the Chicago Blackhawks. But, yeah, that was an interesting club. You're right, um, Rob. They had, um, they had some real, real talent. And the thing that really stands out in my mind with that club was how involved offensively the Rangers defensemen were. Dave Maloney, Ron Greshner, Mario Marois, Mike McEwen. They all, Dave Farish, they really were very – Carol Vadney had an outstanding offensive series, and that's uh, both against the Flyers, the Kings, and the Islanders. And uh, another thing that really stood out uh, just in this Ranger uh, Islander series was the Rangers four on four. You know, they really they really outnumbered the Islanders down low. To this day, I don't think there has been a Ranger team that crashed the net like that seventy nineteen. They they consistently outnumbered the Flyers and the Islanders down low to get a lot of goals on rebounds. And unfortunately, they couldn't carry over to Montreal because the Canadians had such a big mobile defense. I mean, they were huge. You know, they neutralized that New York Rangers, uh, those forwards, those small, quick forwards they had down low. But, um, yeah, that was interesting. Um, and they played your Kings, I guess, in the first round, huh? Yeah, so, yeah, so they started <laughs> <laughs> a, little, a little different than uh, a little different than 2014, yeah. I guess. It was... <laughs> We want to talk about that that Kings team, which you know, and again, a much different NHL best of uh, three series that came out and just blasted the Kings with seven goals in the yeah. first game. Um, you know that 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 Kings team also with a losing record going into right. the play, going into the the idea that teams could have losing records in the in the Stanley Cup playoffs today is it's just crazy. unheard of. I, I remember that Kings team. You know, they they had they had their stalwarts. They had the Charlie uh, Simmers, the Marcel Dion's, the Dave Taylors. They had Butch Goring, you know, on the club and former Ranger Mark Heaslip. You know, uh, he played one season with the Rangers and he went to, to L.A. And they had Sil Apps, you know, the former Ranger and, and Penguin. He had his best years with the Penguins, but you know, he played uh, for the Kings uh, in the playoffs uh, that particular year. But it was the Kings defenseman. And uh, I mean, you talk about journeymen personified. You, know, you had former Bruin Daryl Edestrand. You had Rob Palmer, uh, Randy Holt, who's one of the toughest guys and one of the best fighters in National Hockey League history. You had Randy Maneri, who was a who was a journeyman hockey player. I mean, names from the past. I mean, you look at their bubblegum cards, and they just played for virtually you know everybody. You know, Robbie Palmer. Uh, and then Mario Lassard and goal, you know, it's just, it, it brings back, it brings back memories of those Kings teams. They were, they had tremendous talent on, uh, with a few players and they had some real, real mediocre, uh, talent, uh, to fill that roster. Yeah. Especially, yes. Yeah, like you said, especially on defense. Mario Lassard had a decent year in goal though. Um, you know, we could segue that in the regular season was one of the Rangers biggest weaknesses. It was in goal yet the playoff started and John Davidson what he did in that playoff series that playoff year was rather yeah, that's impressive. true the Rangers had three goalies on the roster they had Wayne Thomas and Doug Sotart and uh, Davidson you know obviously was the uh, carried uh, the workload uh, and he was really magnificent in the playoffs but then he got hurt and I, th- and I, I think he probably got hurt and looking at some of the video and remembering back I think he got hurt in that Islander series he was able to gut it out but he just was not the same against the Montreal Canadiens. He just wasn't. And it came out later that he was really had a pretty significant injury. And not that they, they would have beaten Montreal anyway, but they needed Davidson to play like he did against the Flyers and the Islanders to really do anything against Montreal. And, and you're right. The Rangers made short work of the Kings in a two out of three. You know, they blew him out in game one. And then I think it was a two nothing shutout. Or I think it was, uh, no, uh, no. The last game of the series went to Did overtime. Went to overtime. That's right. Esposito won in overtime, right? Yeah, that's right. That's that right. was in that was in L.A. That was that was in L.A. That was in L.A. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Esposito, yeah. You know, Davidson had a strong game, thirty-five save. Esposito scored both uh, goals in that game. Actually, I remember the overtime goal. Then they went against Philadelphia, and this one really surprised me because even though the Flyers were an older club, Bobby Clark was older, Reggie Leach, Rick McLeish were older. 
the Flyers still had some very, very good hockey players. You know, they had a, Bill Barber. You know, they had, the uh, I think, the rookie of the year that year, Kenny Linsman, the rat. Uh, yeah. They had some real, and of course, Bernie Perron had that real bad eye injury and they had Wayne Stevenson. It was a mismatch. The goaltending was a mismatch. Wayne Stevenson just, just could not fill the gap that uh, Bernie Perron left them when he had that eye injury. And the Rangers really exploited a very slow, lumbering flyer defense with, um, Ben Wilson and Bob Daly, you know, it was just a, a different Jimmy Watson was, you know, he was aging at that time. His brother, Joe had already left the team. Schultz wasn't on the team anymore. Big bird. Don Seleski was not on the team, but they had Paul, they had Paul Holmgren, who was a, a physically imposing, uh, talented forward for the flyers. They still had Mel Bridgman. So they still had a, a tough club and they still had some offense but the rangers just their speed just again they just uh they flyers defensemen and the goaltending just couldn't keep up with the rangers yeah you know the rangers offense in that series is just unheard of with eight goals in one game six in another five seven goals yep. per game really set it up set them up nicely to go into the series with the islanders who were the high-flying team of the league that year um with Bossier, Bossy, Trache. I guess we don't need to, to bring up all these names. <laughs> well, they were loaded. Gary Howitt. I mean, they had, they were just a loaded hockey team. You had, uh, you know, you had Wayne Merrick and you had Billy Harris, you know, who was a, uh, I think he was a runner up for rookie of the year with the Islanders. If he didn't win it that year, I think, um, he was drafted along with the, uh, Tom Lysiak, uh, in the expansion draft. Uh, Lysiak went to the Flames and the Islanders had, they were loaded. They, you know, they just, uh, they had Bobby Nystrom, Clark Gillies and Nystrom was, he was a thorn in the Rangers' side throughout his career, and he really showed that in the playoffs too. And but you know, the Rangers did to the Islanders what they did to the Flyers. Their forechecking was so aggressive, and the Rangers' speed. The Rangers were more hungry. The Islanders had beaten the Rangers five out of eight games that year, and I think the um, and the Islanders just blitzkrieg the Blackhawks. I mean, they just made short work of the Blackhawks. I think in four straight, they probably just took the Rangers too lightly. They couldn't summon up the energy and the discipline quick more quickly enough to and the Rangers have been doing that all playoffs. The Rangers were a possessed team and a determined team right from the drop of the puck against the Kings. And I think the, uh, it took the Islanders by surprise and they just couldn't summon up enough of that to counteract uh, the Rangers. And it was shocking. It really was. The Islanders Rangers went into the guard, the Coliseum that first game and beat the Islanders handily four to one, I believe. The second game, I believe Poffin won in overtime, which I remember going, thinking back to that. I thought once Poffin won in overtime, I said, Oh, here we go. I think this is where the Islanders are going to really step up. And then the Rangers won the third game at the Garden, uh, and the Islanders won it game four. They tied up. I don't know if you saw the video of that, but Davidson in overtime, game four, it was a tie game. There was a loose puck inside the Ranger blue line, and it was a race between Nystrom and Davidson, and Davidson lost that race brutally, and uh, basically, uh, Nystrom had an open net to, uh, t- to shoot the puck and, and, and tie up the series and win it over time. And then again, I thought the Islanders were going to come back and win it. But, uh, after that, the Rangers won the next two games and, uh, they upset the Islanders. Um, what are your thoughts from that series? Anything that, that stood out to you, Rob, in uh, the Rangers Islander series? Well, you know, the most important thing you brought up before is how well the, the four check and defense was mm-hmm. in that series. You know, Bob, Brian Trache scored in the first period of game one. And his that top line of the Islanders didn't score again until the last game of the series, Game Six, when Bossy scored in the first period, and that was it. So only two goals for that top, top scoring line in hockey that season. Two goals in six games is pretty impressive, and that's really what led the way. You know, the Rangers weren't scoring goals in that series like they were against Philly. They really counted on shutting down the top the top guns for the Islanders. And they did. That was a power play goal, by the way. That Bossy Bossy scored in Game Six. That was their first power play goal that the Islanders scored in that series. And you're right. The Rangers really shut that line down. One of the things that really surprised me was Al Arbor. And I think he learned from this. I think this was a lesson for Al Arbor. He rotated his goal. He started off with Chico Resch in the first game, right? The Rangers beat him up pretty good. Yeah, you know, right? Yeah, going back back and forth between Chico and Billy Smith. Um, that was the last time that really happened in the postseason consistently for the Islanders. I think it was this next season that they got rid of uh, Resch via trade, I believe. I think it was a big trade that they had made. But you're right, they went back and forth, and Smitty played better against the Rangers, and I thought he was going to stay with Smith. 
but they had rotated all year round. You know, if, the, if you look, they basically played the same amount of games. But, uh, it was mm-hmm. the next season, obviously, when the Islanders started the Stanley Cup run that Billy Smith really uh, distinguished himself as the, one of the greatest money goalies of all time. And I think that helped out the Rangers, too. I mean, they stayed with Davidson, they, and but the Islanders went back and forth, and I think that was a big difference. And the Rangers were so good 4-on-4. Four four. They just dominated the, the Islanders 4-on-4 four four in that series. And their four, like you said, Rob, their forechecking was incredible. Bobby Sheehan just brought up uh, a series before from New Haven. I think scored four goals against the Islanders in that series, or combined uh, with the Flyers series. He was just incredible. Uh, he was a real shot in the arm, and Ron Gresham had an outstanding series, and Andres Hedberg and Will Kachuk did a great job on that uh, on that line. It was Kachuk, Vickers, and Andres Hedberg that went up against the uh, Mike Bossy Trottier Gillies line, and they just shut them down. And Poffin had a good series, but the Rangers def- Vadney was outstanding, Davidson was outstanding. They made some, and there was one key. I don't know if you remember reading about this, but there was one key play in Game Five. At the Coliseum, Mike Kaziki had scored a tying goal where the puck did not go. They didn't have replay at that time. The, the puck hit the post and the Rangers were beside themselves. They counted, they counted it as a goal. They didn't have replay at the time. Replay clearly showed it hit the post and the Rangers, despite that bad break and the Islanders tying up that game, Rangers showed the fortitude to not let that bother them. They wound up beating the Islanders 4-3 in that game five, won in game six, two to one on, on Ryan Gresham's power play goal. So yeah, it was amazing. I'll never forget them winning that series. And I was up in, um, I was up in Pawtucket. I was working for the Pawtucket Red Sox in their front office at that time and watching the replays at night, listening to it on radio. It was just amazing. And of course the Bruins were doing their number on who they were playing. The Montreal Canadiens, I think beat them in seven games. In that, um, what turned out to be the semifinal round. Yeah, it was very, uh, very interesting. And, uh, New York was just beside themselves with uh, the Rangers finally beating the, uh, the Suburbanites. They, they didn't. I, I, we won't spend too much time on the, the postscript for the New York Islanders. Things definitely changed much for the better yeah. for them with the team being sold and winning a few cups after right away. that. Next, very next season, right? Yeah. Um, but yeah, you know, very next year. It's just, the finals started out setting up nicely for the Rangers uh, with Montreal going seven games with Boston playing a really tough series, yep. including OT in game seven at the Forum. Um, but it got off to an ominous start with, I don't know if you remember, Montreal using its power and not wanting to play it. The, they wanted an extra day after their game seven overtime. And the game started at 4 p.m. on Sunday, game one. Yeah, I, that I did not remember. Uh, but I knew the Rangers came out and they won the game four to one. I mean, they came out flying against uh, the Montreal. You had Vickers and I believe Greshner scored in the first period. You know, and then Esposito and Dave Maloney had scored. But Bunny, uh, Bunny LaRock was the goaltender for the Montreal Canadiens. They started LaRock in that series. And I don't remember why because you did, but Dryden started and got pulled. Oh, okay. And LaRock came Oh, I in. thought, uh, LaRock, I thought the Rock had played. The Rangers won, and then the Rock got hurt in uh, warm-ups the next game. Before the game, he couldn't go, and then Dryden came in, and that was history. Yeah, then Dryden came in and won the next gotcha. four. Gotcha. Yeah, so uh, Ken Dryden just shut them down. Kenny Dryden just shut um, the Rangers down. Davidson was hurt, you know, and, and, and even game two, the Rangers got off to, I think, a 2 nothing start in game two. I think Hedberg and Duguay scored in the first period. And then all hell broke loose after that. It was just, uh, I think the Canadians scored six unanswered goals. And then the closest the Rangers came after that, I think, was in game four. The Rangers took them to overtime, and Serge Savard had uh, scored overtime goal at Madison Square Garden. I mean, the Rangers showed some grit. They took the, the, the Canadians to overtime after losing two games in a row, one at the Coles- one at the um, Forum, and then the first game at Madison Square Garden. But after that, they were just, they were just too beat up. They just couldn't handle that humongous Montreal def- defense with uh, Rod Langway and Serge Savard and Larry Robinson and Rick Chartraw and, uh, and uh, Brian Engblom. I mean, they just, they, they just couldn't handle a big, strong mobile defense. And that's what neutralized those, those gritty Ranger forwards from outnumbering them down low. They just couldn't get any time and space down there. And, LaFleur and, uh, and Jacques Lemaire had an outstanding series. And you just look at the, the Steve Shutt. I mean, you had, and look at the defensive 
forwards that the Canadians had. You got Rajon Hull, you had Doug Risebrow, you had Doug Jarvis, Bob Gainey. I mean, my God, Mario Tremblay, uh, these guys could play both ways. They, they were 20 goal scorers and they were outstanding defense, uh, defensive forwards. I mean, they just, they just took away all the time and space for the Rangers. They just could not, Rangers could not, just could not match that talent. It was just overwhelming. It's, it's easier to, to name the people on that team that aren't in the Hall of Fame yeah. than are in the Hall of Fame. I know. And even Mark Napier. Mark Napier is another defensive uh, forward that, I mean, they had so many great two-way hockey players. I mean, they were so well coached. But their defense, you know, their defense was big, strong, mobile. I mean, they was just, uh, that's why they could go up against the Flyers. That's why they could compete against the Bruins. You know, they just had those big, strong and on the forwards, you know, some of their forwards, you know, Yvonne Lambert was a big, tough uh, f- uh, physical presence uh, at forward, you know, and Bob Gainey was a tough, uh, a tough player. And they had some, uh, they had some offensively tough forwards as well. And they were the complete teams. And I think that was their fourth Stanley Cup in a row, Rob, if memory serves me right. It was their fourth Stanley Cup in a row. Um, you know, Bob Gainey, I, lo- I love talking about Bob Gainey, but there weren't enough goals to go around yeah. on that team. You know, only play with one puck at a time, but Bob Ganey was so good at defense that, but he was a heart trophy caliber player, just didn't score goals. And, and a lot of people believe that's why we have the Selkie trophy is because they needed to give an award to Bob Ganey for how, how good he was on the ice, how, how he shut everybody down, uh, without scoring goals. And that's where we got the Selkie. He owned the Selkie trophy for a long time. He did. That was the Bob Ganey trophy. It really, really was. It really, really was. They were so. So if you look at, it, they won four in a row. Then the Islanders won four in a row. So he had two teams that had won eight, uh, eight cups. From so seventy six to seventy nine was the was the Canadians, and four for the Islanders, and then four for the Oilers yeah. in five years. So three teams had won the next thirteen Stanley Cups, right? Wow. Yeah, that's amazing. That <laughs> that really is amazing. Different NHL today. We'll we'll never no, see that again. That's true. And, uh, but that was a, that for the New York Rangers, that was a very inspiring year. Freddie Shiro really did a great job with the New York Rangers that particular year and they couldn't sustain it. You know, the next year obviously wasn't, uh, wasn't as successful. The New York Islanders had lost two devastating. The year before, the Islanders got beat up by the Toronto Maple Leafs in the playoffs. They had learned a lesson because the Islanders had an outstanding season the year before too. It was the Toronto Maple Leafs with Daryl Sittler and Tiger Williams. They had a big physical club and they really physically beat up the Islanders, which was surprising because the Islanders still had Clark Gillies and Bobby Nystrom. But the Toronto Maple Leafs really did a number on the Islanders. It was a crushing defeat for the Islanders against Toronto, crushing defeat by the New York Rangers. And I think the Islanders learned a lot of lessons those two years and after that, they I think they had won 19 playoff series in a row. To this day, no team has ever matched that in any sport, not to mention just hockey. Any sport, and it'll never be that. That's that's an almost unbreakable record the way sports are now. Um, even if you look at how Pittsburgh came out this year, just so many games, so much time on the ice. It's a different game. Um, you know, Denny Poffin talks about times when the Islanders wouldn't even come out for games because they needed a break. They just they knew they were so good they could yeah. afford a loss. Whereas today, those two points, you cannot, you can never give up on two points. Even if it's the second week of October, you need to win that game. That's true. And unfortunately for 79, it was probably the high point for, uh, for John Davidson. You know, I think he was battling injuries really, uh, for a while after that. Bobby Sheehan never turned out to be the player that he was in the playoffs, uh, that particular season. That was Phil Esposito's best year with the New York Rangers. Don Maloney went on to have a great, uh, pretty good, pretty solid career as we, as we talked about in the last podcast. And Don Murdoch, unfortunately, I mean, he had some good years after that offensively, but not nearly as good as he had the talent. Uh, Walker Chuck had a very, uh, he finished his career with the New York Rangers, I believe, a year or two later. He had a very good career with them as part of the Bulldog line. Steve Vickers was on the downside of, of his career after that. He was a good player for them. And, you know, Ron Gresham was battling inju- uh, injuries really throughout his career. Vadney never matched his the 78-79 season after that. And, yeah, it was a different team. It was a different team after that. Uh, they really never could put it together. Although Herb Brooks took over about a year and a half, two years later when the Smurfs came around. And 
I mean, and Anders Hedberg went on to have some pretty decent years under uh, Herb Brooks, as did Ron Duguay. Ron Duguay had a good, good playoff that particular year in, in 78, 79, had a decent career under Herb Brooks. Uh, so there were some players that continued to do pretty well, but uh, as a club, the Rangers really, really weren't uh, nearly as good uh, after that, after that 79, 8, 79 season. But that was a very, uh, very, very exciting time for New York hockey. You know, it really, really was. It was, uh, and I don't know if it's been matched since. I don't think a New York Rangers Islanders series has come close. Although '94, when the Rangers beat the Islanders. The Islanders were a decent club, but they weren't. Uh, it wasn't as competitive, I don't believe, as that seventy-eight, seventy-nine series. No, no, not at all. You know that. You know the yeah the the ninety-four Islanders definitely were anywhere cl- no. anywhere close to to matching either the Rangers or Islanders from nineteen seventy-nine. They couldn't. Uh, they just couldn't match up with the uh, the hired guns that the Rangers brought in that particular year, and and of course. Uh, Mike Richter playing his lights out in net. Any uh, other thoughts, Rob, to round out this particular podcast in the, for the 1978-79 Rangers playoffs? You know, what was really impressive about that team, you know, really is, John, you know, John Davidson had a, had a 2.3 goals against in that playoff. And we're used to that today with, you know, having a goals against that low is, is, is commonplace. Jonathan Quick was 10th in the league at 2.46 this year. But to give you an idea about 1979, only one goaltender had a goal had a goals against under 2.5. Uh, goalies in the top ten were in the in the middle threes. So for John Davidson to come out in games where eight seven eight goals seven goals were scored and put a, and put up a 2.3 goals against is, is remarkable and really really carried them through through the series. Yeah, and if Montreal. you look at some of the replays, some of those goals, and we talked about this I think in a previous podcast, a lot of those goals were you know, were slap shots from the point and from up high. I mean it was not although the Rangers that particular against the Flyers and against the Islanders, the Rangers scored goals like they do today. They outnumbered down low, they were crashing the net, and there was a lot of gritty goals from shots from the uh, from the face off circle, from the point but if you look at a lot of the goals that John Davidson came, uh, gave up, especially against uh, you know the likes of Dennis Potvin, they were you know blasts from the blue line or uh, from between the dots. You know they were long lo- you know long range goals that you don't see today that often. You know it's very rare to see a goalie giving up a slap shot if it's not deflected in. You know if it's a clean shot, and you saw that a lot in the ni- early nineteen well the nineteen seventies and the early to mid nineteen eighties. Yeah, it, just such a different league, but. Hopefully a team that we can remember and keep talking about. Some great Rangers Absolutely. history there. And we'll have to think about maybe going off the menu uh, again sometime soon. We'll have to um, think about what player. Walker Chuk is a player that might merit some consideration for a forgotten hockey player. He came up with the New York Rangers when Marv Albert and the National Hockey League used to – he went by the name of Walter Tatechuk. And then it wasn't until a couple of years later that he made the correct uh, pronouncement. He said, no, it's Kachuk. And then, of course, I believe his nephews went on to play in the National Hockey League. The Kachuks that have been uh, playing in the NHL for the last 10, 15 years, they are related to the original Kachuk, and that's Walt Kachuk, who, when he first came up at the Rangers, they had the Bulldog line of Billy Fairburn and Dave Ballon, and then Steve Vickers took over when the Rangers traded Dave Ballon. So you had two-thirds of that Bulldog line, that 1978-79 uh, playoffs an aging Walt Kachuk who did an outstanding job and yet uh, an aging Steve Vickers uh, making two thirds of that. And then you had Anders Hedberg who slid down after Ulfie Nielsen got hurt. He was the scoring winger on that particular line. So, uh, yeah, he might be a player that would warrant some consideration. We've already done Steve Vickers already. Yeah. And we are, and I did, I think earlier I did the Ulf Nielsen and Anders Hedberg duet. You know, I did them together. So. Ron Greshner is another one. We might want to consider Ron Greshner, although he is probably still in the limelight today. The Rangers bring him back. He's still involved in a lot of community activities. But Walker Chuck might be somebody that we should uh, maybe take a look at. So um, any uh, final thoughts, Rob, before we close up? No, that's it. I'm looking forward to it uh, and looking forward to to maybe talking about a team like Vegas one day. (laughs) Uh, We'll definitely really go off the menu on that one. Uh, Maybe if they win the Cup, we'll have to do a special. We'll have to talk about them as a separate podcast but folks we would like to have you um access our web uh, website at go tommy boy productions.lipson.com that's go tommy boy productions.lipson.com 
Rob and I would love to hear your thoughts. You can contact us by just uh, clicking on the contact button up top. We'd love to hear your thoughts, uh, what players you would like for us to profile, what off-the-menu topics you would like for us to talk about. And also, please uh, subscribe, whether you listen to us on SoundCloud or iTunes or Google Play Music. Wherever you listen to us, it's free. Just hit the uh, subscribe button. We'd like to have you uh, become a member and a fan. This way you'll get the... Uh, the episodes as soon as they hit the airwaves. So again, that's uh, gotommyboyproductions.lipson.com is our webpage. So Rob, I want to thank you for an outstanding job. That was a great topic. Look forward to our next podcast in a couple of weeks. Just to wrap it up, for Rob Berger, I'm Tom Browning. This has been another edition of the Forgotten Hockey Players of Broadway. Thanks for tuning in. Thank you for listening. This has been a Go Tommy Boy production. 